at that moment, I believe nobody uh, ever expected this uh, operation to take place for the simple reason we uh, did not uh, monitor any preparations for any military attack from the Ukrainian side. We started to uh, see that kind of preparations sometime in early February. More than that, we received reliable uh, intelligence information uh, early in February that the plans to use military force against Donbas and further on against Crimea are scheduled uh, at the beginning of March, uh, to be more exact, exactly on the 8th of March. This is the information we received prior to the decision of President Putin to uh, start uh, the Russian special operation, which in uh, this context definitely was a response, definitely was a preemptive measure, definitely was a defensive a, a uh, operation in order to prevent uh, any, any uh, bigger uh, bloodshed. A, a response or a preemptive measure? Which one was it? Well, a preemptive measure, but uh, as you perfectly well know, and everybody hopefully knows, the uh, Ukrainian military operation against Donbass, against regions in southeastern Ukraine, did take place the previous eight years. The previous eight years, while the so-called Minsk agreements uh, were in force, and uh, the basic idea of these agreements was a political dialogue between the conflicting parts inside of Ukraine in order to reach a political agreement. Where, where do you think the conflict stands now? Well, it, it develops. We have uh, two tracks, the military track, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, it depends on who uh, evaluates the situation. The capabilities of the Ukrainian military force is uh, now pressed down. And uh, we proceed, I mean, the Russian military force proceeds, uh, makes progress in, the, in terms of this special operation. But the uh, parallel track is negotiations, which uh, take place regularly and uh, does uh, bring uh, certain progress, certain uh, mutual understanding of the problems which are to be solved. So we are somewhere in the middle of the process and somewhere in between the two tracks. And uh, hopefully we uh, have already overcome the lowest, the lowest point in this development and uh, have now possibilities to reach the final solution, whether in military terms or in political terms. It, it depends. The choice depends 100 percent on how uh, Kyiv reacts on that and whether uh, the West supports Kyiv in denying any political compromises or motivates Kyiv to accept political compromises with Russia. Um, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is insisting that Russia is committed to easing tension in the region. Uh, how could that be achieved? The total withdrawal of Russian forces, would that be a way forward? No. Uh, you know, the decision to start the Russian uh, special operation was taken, uh, taking into consideration, sorry for this, uh, taking into consideration the uh, well-predictable perspectives. In case this operation uh, wouldn't have taken place later, in some weeks, in some months, probably in some years, but we would be definitely have a big military conflict between Russia on one side and NATO countries using Ukraine as a weapon on the other side. And uh, the Russian military operation has created uh, possibilities, has created an option of uh, escaping this big war which could have developed into a third world war. So to ease tensions means simply that we prevent this development to happen. We want to see Ukraine as an independent, sovereign, neutral, free from uh, military alliances country, which does not create any military threats towards its neighbors, Russia included. Sergei Lavrov has also said that Russia remains committed to the continuing peace talks. 
Uh, have they moved forward at all uh, over the last few weeks? Yes, I believe that we have reached certain progress in some parts of our negotiations. Uh, in mainly uh, talking about the future security status, security arrangements, uh, collective security uh, guarantees uh, to Ukraine. Uh, we, uh, on both sides, understand perfectly well that eventual uh, entrance of Ukraine uh, into NATO will uh, just create new problems for uh, collective security in Europe, for national security of Ukraine. So this option is not valid any longer, and it is recognized by, uh, by Kyiv. They are ready to introduce certain amendments in their constitution if needed. But what is most important, they are ready to stop demanding Ukrainians' membership in NATO. We have some additional uh, mutual understandings, as far as I, as far as I am informed, uh, concerning the military activities of third countries on the territory of Ukraine, which will be possible only if agreed between the countries which will uh, be uh, guaranteeing, uh, guaranteeing the security of Ukraine. Okay, this is an essential step forward, but uh, still we have uh, many more things to discuss and to uh, I'm sure get there, agreement. There are, I'm sure there are many other things to discuss, but I wonder if the quickest way forward would be for President Putin to talk directly to President Zelensky. Uh, only in case we know what these talks will be about. Because uh, as for now, these talks will definitely be used by Mr. Zelensky in order to blame Mr. Putin for everything possible and to uh, position himself as the only defender of uh, sovereignty and independence of Ukraine. The uh, talks which are not well prepared will just uh, create additional problems, not solutions. So these talks are to be prepared, and this is what happens inside the negotiation process. President Zelensky said it would be difficult to talk to President Putin at the moment because of the accusations of war crimes against the president. I, I may talk about that in more details. It's not needed. But uh, believe me, it's absolutely difficult for us to continue to talk to Mr. Zelensky, uh, creating that kind of provocations, which do, does not does not uh, assist the negotiation process at all. But nevertheless, negotiations continue, and hopefully they will, at the end, uh, give a result which will make it possible to, to meet personally, uh, I mean, Mr. Uh, Putin and Mr. Zelensky. We are, are not you, there yet. Then. Both the US and the UK insist that war crimes are being committed. Um, the Kremlin is now saying that Europe will have to establish dialogue with Russia in the future. How do you think that dialogue could look uh, when you consider the accusations flying around at the moment as a diplomat? To start somewhere, to start somewhere. We could have had, had a, a good discussion on that within the Security Council of the United Nations. Russia has demanded an extra meeting of that Security Council, and that demand was blocked by uh, the United Kingdom. They did not want to talk about that in the Security Council, and did not, they did not find anything extraordinary in that situation in Busha the day before yesterday and yesterday. For me, this is self-explanatory. This is where the dialogue is to take place. This is where evidences are to be exchanged. But the Western countries do not want to have that dialogue openly, publicly. They just prefer to continue to produce false ex uh, accusations towards Russia and against Russia. And this is the style we will never accept because we know the truth. But you must feel um, uh, you're in a very difficult position as a diplomat to see Russia so increasingly isolated from the rest of the world. Do you feel Russia is standing alone? Definitely not. Definitely not. I, I know perfectly well that the uh, United Nations consists of 193 countries. I know perfectly well that just uh, 40 countries, 40 countries plus, uh, practice sanctions against Russia. 40 countries out of 193 is more, is less than one fifth. It is not the international community. It's not the majority. And Russia definitely does not feel isolated. It, uh, the, the feeling of uh, an isolated Russia may appear only if you look at Russia from Washington or uh, the Brussels, for example. 
but we have so many other places which are different from the Western world and which are still balanced, which are still very much uh, concerned about the NATO expansion, which are very much concerned about the attempts of the Western world to create a unipolar uh, construction of this world. So definitely Russia is not isolated. Russia is definitely not alone. And Russia definitely will not give up because some 40 countries uh, see the future of the world differently. Lastly, uh, Constantine, what does success in this special military operation look like to you? Wh where would it end? Uh, for me, as a Russian citizen, uh, the success story is that we in Russia feel secure, including those Russian citizens which live in Crimea, including those people, citizens of Russia or citizens of other countries who live in uh, southeastern Ukraine, in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk republics. Security for people of different nationalities speaking different languages, who live in Ukraine, so they, that they would not be afraid of Nazi groups, radical groups, killing civilians for uh, speaking other languages or experiencing uh, other uh, traditions or cultures. I uh, think that the success story for whole Europe will be security arrangements, which we proposed, by the way, in December last year, which will be in inclusive, not exclusive, which will be equal for every European country, and uh, so that we will have a security arrangement which will be indivisible. That's for me a success story, and I hope that the Russian military operation is a very good step forward in reaching that desired situation. Russian Federation Senator Konstantin Kosachev, many thanks to you for joining us on the agenda. Thank you.